Welcome everyone to tonight's Code with Jason meetup. Tonight, uh, Ben has bravely offered to share his uh, code base, a code base of his for me to critique in front of the group. So thank you, Ben, for that. And we'll dive right in. You. Yeah. <laughs> Can, can I give like a really short preamble of what it's for? Yeah, please do. Yeah, so uh, I just transitioned into tech. I'm doing an intern at uh, FreshBooks as full stack developer, but wrote my first line of JavaScript a year ago, and uh, this is my first production app, and it, I wanted to solve a real world problem, so it's for a dog adoption. And I'll throw the link in the chat, but it's for an outfit in Mexico who were using social media and they needed something more robust. Um, so it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. First app, just wanted to set expectations there, nothing too fancy, but I really appreciate you having a look at Jason and, and everyone else. So. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing the code. I, I hope this will be uh, interesting for you and everybody else. And I have the website up here. Um, just curious, how how did you get connected with this organization? Obviously, you're in Canada, not Mexico. How was this connection made? I, well, trying to get a, I adopted a dog during the pandemic and it was impossible to find uh, dogs because everybody was adopting dogs and ended up getting hooked up through word of mouth with these uh, small outfit in Mexico. And that's, you know, getting my dog through them and knew they're really good people, but they were just bootstrapped, like, you know, really grassroots. And I'm like, Hey, I'm studying web development. You need a website. Uh, you know, the rest is history. So, oh, that's great. Um, okay, well, I'm going to share my screen and we can look up some code or we can look at some code rather. Okay, share. There we are. Okay, so I have these kind of in order of how I want to address them. So first, we're going to look at some model files and then we're going to look at some controller files. This app obviously is relatively small, so I didn't find a lot to find fault with. Um, the main, the main things that I wanted to, wanted to address are in the models and controllers. Um, so let's dive right in with this first, uh, model here, adopter profile. I'm going to take a quick scroll through this file so you guys can get a feel for just the size of it. So we have some validations and such, and then a handful of methods, and then we can see it's about 115 lines total. Something I talked about in one of my earlier talks is the idea of what's incidental and what's essential. Um, so there's, in any file we can have, um, there's essential points and there's incidental details. And the idea is to highlight what's essential and hide what's incidental. Um, I see a comment screen frozen. I don't think my screen's frozen. Can you guys see me scrolling through right now? Yeah, I just paused at a certain spot. Um, so anyway, there's essential, essential and incidental. So when I look at this file, the first thing I notice, of course, is just the volume of the validations. And so if we look at the name of this class, adopter profile, maybe all these validations aren't quite so essential to the central idea of this class. And so this is something that I would seek to hide away somewhere. And so maybe what I would be inclined to do here is take these validations and tuck them away in a concern. Um, doesn't have to be a concern, could just be a Ruby mix-in, but one way or another, I would tuck these away so that most of these validations could be just one line where it says include such and such module or concern. Having said that, I didn't pay super close attention to what these validations all are. It seems, Ben, maybe you can maybe you can tell me. Um, it seems like maybe there's just a fairly large form associated with an adopter profile. And so just by virtue of the fact that there are a lot of fields, you were going to get a lot of validations along with that. Is that the idea? Yeah, you know, it's just like an intake form explaining who you are and your experience, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then then I, I think I would stick all these in a single concern, perhaps. Okay, my next point. 
Oh, sorry. Somebody has a bit of background noise. Would you mind muting your um, audio for me? Thanks. Oh, I think it's actually not muted. I just thought it was. Okay, I don't hear it anymore. Okay, so these next five methods or so, um, for anybody who doesn't know, in Ruby, these methods that are suffixed with a question mark and return true or false, these are called predicate methods. So there's something that I would be inclined to maybe do slightly differently with these predicate methods. Um, it seems to me, and Ben, tell me if, if I'm wrong, it seems to me that most of these predicate methods are kind of, you're wanting to take these Boolean values from the database and just make it so you can use this nice conventional question mark style uh, syntax to get these values. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, they're actually using the validations above. Um, so the validation is going to be active depending on or, or, or inactive depending on the um, the value of the method call. Oh, I see. So I'm going to take, uh, yeah. take, for example, do you rent? Oh, I see. Yeah, because the, the form is also a user stimulus for some conditional fields that uh, show depending on what radio button you click. So I didn't want validations on things that weren't going to be filled out depending on the radio button. I see. So now that I understand that, one thing that I might be inclined to do is I might actually be inclined to put this do your rent method near right. the validation so I can see that that belongs to that. Because that wasn't obvious to me. I had no guess as to what these were used for. Um, but if those were close to one another, then then that might be more obvious. Um, and just the other thing, tiny simplification we can do here, um, rather than saying do you rent equals equals true, if I'm not mistaken, that can just reduce down to do you rent, and we don't need the equals equals true. Yeah. And then the only one that's like a little bit different is this. Um, I actually find it a little bit funny to say fenced access false. So let's, now that I understand that these are kind of connected to these validations, let's see what this is all about. Okay, so if fenced access is false, then, okay, so I'll word this a different way. We only do this fenced alternative validation if fenced access is false. Is that right, Ben? Correct. Okay. So to me, the, the if fenced access false is a little bit tough for me to, to think about. It puts a little bit of a cognitive burden on me maybe more than, than what's necessary. Let's, let's see if we can think of another way that puts less cognitive burden. Um, if, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to understand the real world scenario here. So if fenced access is false, can, can you explain to me, Ben, just what does this fenced yeah, yeah. alternative mean? So one of the common questions is, do you have a fenced garden that the dog can go in? Uh, and if it, you choose yes, then you can continue with the form. If you choose no, then another text area pops up and it says, okay, how do you plan to look after the dog without having a fenced area? Okay. So if you don't have a fenced area, then you need to fill out fenced alternative? Correct. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, and I guess you did fenced access false. I, I, I think I see why you did that now. Maybe what I would be inclined to do is change the if to an unless and change mm -hmm. fence access false to fenced access or even has fencing or something like that. Mm -hmm. in, in any case, I think I would flip the, um, the Boolean here and instead of if and then false, do unless and then not suffix this with false. That makes sense. Okay. And then this phone number is an interesting one here. So again, talking about what's essential versus what's incidental. Um, this is an adopter profile. The idea of a phone number is fairly relevant, but maybe all these details about the specifics of the formatting of the phone number aren't, um, they, they wouldn't qualify as essential points. They're more incidental details. 
And so what I sometimes do in my applications, because obviously phone numbers are a relatively common thing to have to deal with, I have what they call a value object where it's not attached to a database record or anything like that. And it doesn't matter. Well, here's the significant thing about a value object. With some kinds of things, identity matters. Like it matters if if you have a specific, if you're talking about human beings, um, one is different from another. One John Smith is not the same as another John Smith. Even though they say, even though they have the same name, they're two distinct people. But with phone numbers, it's uh, the identity doesn't matter. If my phone number is 555-555-5555, that's the only thing you need to know about it. And if you have the number, the identity doesn't matter. So that's what a value object is. It's when the identity doesn't matter. So I often will have a value object called phone number. And then that class called phone number knows how to do all its formatting and stuff like that. And so then all this can move out of whatever class. Well, in this case, it can move out of this class and you can just have maybe somewhat of a one-liner. I do see you have something called phone lib here. What is that, Ben? Yeah, that's a, a gem that just helps to make sure a valid phone number um, is entered from, uh, like it, it checks all international uh, formats. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, and let's see, everything else here seems fine to me. I will close that one. And Ben, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have anything to say or ask or anything like that. Okay, now we have this dog class. Let's scroll through both so you can see it and to remind myself. Okay, yeah, I think this was my comment here, Ben. Um, we have all adopted dogs and then we have adopted dogs. At first glance, it's not abundantly clear to me what the difference is between all unadopted dogs. Oh, sorry, it was these two between all unadopted dogs and unadopted dogs. Right, so the way the app is structured um, is multiple organizations could actually use this application. And the idea is, so there's two types of users. There's an adopter user that can sign in that uh, every user is in the user's table. And then each user is either associated with a staff account or an adopter account. And staff accounts are all grouped under an organization. They belong to an organization, uh, as do dogs. So the idea here is um, I can have multiple organizations putting their dogs onto this website and only being able to manage the dogs under their organization. So uh, all unadopted dogs is just for the dogs, uh, is, is, sorry, is all dogs under all organizations that are unadopted. So they could be then shown to say an adopter who wants to see all the dogs available. But for unadopted dogs, that's um, going to return the unadopted dogs under a particular organization, which a particular staff has access to. If that Got makes it. Sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, and I don't understand all the details of how that's how that works and stuff like that, but I think I understand the general idea. Um, if it's possible. I would try to add a distinction to the name of one or both of these. Maybe this, I would, or maybe unadopted dogs, I would call unadopted dogs for organization or something like that. I'm not sure. I'm aware that some of these suggestions that I'm making, because I don't understand the details and background and stuff like that, these suggestions might not make sense. So maybe about 10 to 50% of what I say will end up just being uh, useless, but that's my initial thought when I look at those. No, I, I agree. I think I could do better with uh, more intuitive naming on, on these methods. Okay. Um, user class, did I have a comment on this? I left the tab open, so I feel like I must have. Um, but when I look at it, everything looks okay to me. Um, let's move on. Ah, just a small 
tip here. So, you know, in general, even though I made the suggestion to change that one um, validation from if to unless, in general, I personally have a hard time with unless. I find it harder to understand than if. And so whenever I come across one, well, I'm hesitant to use it. Um, but in this case, rather than doing the map and then inside of the map having a conditional, I believe you can do another enumeration before the map and you could have a reject and you could say statuses.keys.reject and then inside the block, um, you could reject the ones where status is adoption made. Because I think that's the idea right here, right? You want to exclude the ones where status is adoption made? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so you could do a reject before this, and then in your map, you, of course, then wouldn't need this conditional. You would only have that there. Yeah, I think that that's the sense. only comment that I wanted to make there. Oh, and I suppose... This here, um, I don't think you need the equals equals true. I think you can just say app.profile show. Just a tiny comment there. Okay. I had perhaps one or two comments on your schema here. I'm just gonna scroll through and see if I remember. Well, one thing I wasn't sure about is when, um, what criteria to consider when um, specifying null false mm. uh, and, and setting default values. Because I did that in here in, in certain cases, but I can't re quite recall what the best practices are around that. I'm not sure why I did it. Yeah, I had a boss once who was kind of a database administrator type guy. And the advice he gave me was if you can constrain it, then constrain it. Yeah, Jonathan Bennett said, always no false if you can. Um, so I thought that was very good advice from my former boss. If you can constrain it, do constrain it. So that's my rule. Um, and I don't know if you're doing anything with unique constraints. Yeah, it looks like you are. Um, but that's another that's another thing that I always do. If if it can have a unique constraint, then I do put a unique constraint on it. Um, let's see. I did remember some of my um some of my comments here. Oh, this is interesting. Um so I see you have here in your adopter profile your country and all that stuff right in here. I might suggest, now I don't want to tell you that I think you definitely should do this, but here's something I would at least suggest considering. I would consider having an addresses table and then just having an address ID in any table that has an address. That way it's, it's less duplicative. And I, I've had a situation where I had one table that had the addresses right in it and then other tables were appointed to a separate one. And then I had to remember like, okay, it works this way in this one. It works a different way in this other one. It was a bit of a mess. And so I ultimately collapsed those into one and it was a lot tidier from that point on. So I might suggest that. Um, but part of why I'm hesitant is because some of those things might be kind of premature right now. You might never get to the point where that investment pays off. Well, it's funny you say that. I actually... Um... The, the next feature I want to build is a like a successes page, which pulls from the Google Map API and, and then just shows uh, drops pins of where all the dogs have been relocated to. Um, so you can just see a map in North America with these pins, right? And I think that would benefit from having um, a separate table where I'd actually just store location data specifically. Oh, yeah, I could see that. Um, and then analogous comment with phone number. In a project I worked on, I did have a separate phone number table, and it made my life easier in certain ways. But again, not necessarily thinking, I, not necessarily saying I think you should definitely do that. Just something to potentially consider. 
Okay, let me see. Hey, Jason, so in that yeah. case, you would uh, accept nested attributes, you know, in, in the uh, whatever uh, model you're looking at uh, for this um, that had the phone number directly in the in the model? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and my case was a bit more complex. I had phone numbers and fax numbers, and I had entities where you could have any number of phone numbers associated with an entity. So it helped me out that way. That was the main impetus, actually. I had entities where you had not just one phone number for a patient in a, in a medical clinic. It was, you could have any number. So that was kind of what prompted me to do that. Okay. Oh yeah, here's one other comment that I wanted to make. Um, the dog breed, I might suggest separating that into another table or making that into an enum, but probably even a number, uh, a different table, just considering the great number of dog breeds that there are. And I could imagine that list being, uh, I could imagine that list growing and being edited and stuff like that. So that seems like something where you might make your life easier by making that a separate table. Small, but I think significant comment, just, just make sure to uh, maintain consistent um, uh, consistent naming conventions. I would do zip underscore code with this one because those are two separate words. There's nothing worse than having to remember that like, oh yeah, this is a special case. It's not, even though it's two words, it's not, even programming languages have that problem a lot. Like Ruby itself, PHP is notorious for that, where they have functions that are two different words. Sometimes they put an underscore and sometimes they don't put an underscore. It's maddening. So even though that's a tiny thing, I just wanted to mention that. Okay, I think that's about it with the schema. Okay, and Ben, I thank you so much for being a good sport and letting us air your dirty laundry publicly. Yeah, thank you. Um, here I see there's a couple lines commented out. Whenever there's code you don't need, my advice is to always just delete it. Because if it's if you encounter code that's been commented out, it makes you pause and think, hang on a second, what is this? Is this gonna be needed later? Is it not needed? Uh, better just to delete it because it, it doesn't cost zero to have deleted code. It, it does cost something. So that's my advice there. Yeah, I don't even remember what that was for. So it's a good point. Can yeah, I, helmet. Uh, so, you know, when I'm experimenting or trying an idea, um, I won't want to let go of the old old code until I'm sure that that, you know, the new direction is what I want to do. So I've got a fair amount of that, um, like in my, my code base. And what I do is, you know, maybe a month later I go through and, you know, if, if whatever I find that has uh, been commented out, I know that it's been long enough for it not to be relevant anymore. So then I'll get rid of it. Um, uh, anyway, I'm just saying that that's, that's how I go. Uh, that's how I approach, approach things because I'm never quite sure right when I'm making the change, if, if it's going to hold or not. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, you're putting some stuff in a cardboard box and put it in the garage. And if right. you haven't needed it in six months, you can probably it's throw it out. Exactly that. Yeah. 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 I like to just delete it right away, but I, I can understand your way of doing it too. Um, okay. This one's a bit interesting. It might take me a second to reload this back into my head here. Um yeah, I wanted to ask you about this one, Ben, because I see this line here where you do a redirect and then there's some other things that happen after that, but it seems to me that this stuff would never be reached if there's a redirect here. So can you help me understand that one, Ben? Yeah, good question. Uh, so what's it doing? This is... Um, creating so a user an adopter user can go on there and they can they see a dog they like they click a button you sure you want to adopt yes that creates an application uh it it, it worked so this mailer does work it does get reached but um you made a point there that i i can't give you an answer as to why 
it does work um but it seems to uh yeah uh, so Jonathan's saying redirect doesn't return so that would probably explain it oh interesting um well in any case it would seem more logical to me probably to have the redirect at the end because otherwise just when i look at it it throws me a little bit even if it right. works it still gives me it makes me pause and think or have an else uh they're both supposed to happen so uh the idea here is that you you click apply to adopt um it uh, saves that application and then it just redirects you back to that same dog with a uh, a flash saying you know application submitted and then it shoots out an email to um organization staff to say hey someone just applied on a dog just a quick question yeah uh, do, you, uh, do you think it would be appropriate to use like a callback for that mailer in this instance just curious yeah good question i tend to avoid using callbacks for things like mailers because I that that's a bit of a risky thing. Um, like if I do that, then I'm saying that I'm sure that I always want to send an email every time this record is saved, for example. And that's that's to me a bit of a scary statement to make. So I do like to decouple those kinds of actions from the the record life cycle, and I do like to do those things in the controller or something like that rather than a callback um okay yeah and the other thing i wanted to look at is this check dog app status method so where does this get called check dog oh okay before create i see okay oh okay Right, so this is um, allowing, so staff can go on and pause applications for a dog. Like if they've, they've, they've received a ton of applications or the dog isn't quite ready yet, like it's young or it needs to go through some medical, then they can put, post the dog on the site, but they can, um, they can pause it. Um, and that is what this is checking. I see, okay. Okay. So rather than doing this, so I think I would not be inclined to do this in a before action because when I look at this create action, it's not abundantly clear to me that this check is happening at the beginning of it. So I would actually move this check dog app status right into the create. And I might even do it in a slightly different way. So let's see if I understand what this is, Ben. It's if the status is paused, then I redirect the user somewhere so they can be alerted that the application is paused. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So then I might I might do something like this as the first line in create, or near the beginning at least, I would say if application is paused then redirect so i don't think i would even well maybe i would have a separate method but not like this i would i would have the conditional right in here as as one of the early lines mm, okay. to make it abundantly clear that was one thing i wanted is like i i touch a rails code base a little bit at work and i see that actions are actually you know you can have like 40 or 50 lines I mean, you know, RuboCop's usually screaming at you if you've got more than 10, mm -hmm. but I think you ignore that in controllers, it seems. Mm. To me, yeah, so I I have a slight discomfort with like code quality tools and stuff like that because they're they're not that smart, at least maybe not yet. Maybe with AI and stuff, those code quality tools will get smarter, but... To me, it's not exactly the number of lines, it's the amount of cognitive load. Because you could conceivably have quite a lot of lines, but low cognitive load, or you could have just a handful of lines, but high cognitive load. So that's how I think about that. In this case, it seems like 
not too much. Like if we have this create action, first we do a check to see is the application paused? If so, redirect, otherwise continue and just do that all right in here. To me, that seems okay. Okay, adoptions controller. Oh, hey, I was just going to uh, yeah. one comment to Ben. Um, uh, is it a long adopter application that somebody would fill out and then submit it and then find out that the uh, adoptions are paused, you know, since it's on create? Um, right. I, if that's the case as a user, I would just say, like, I'd like to know that they're paused before I go through, you know, whatever. I, I don't know how long your form is, but if it's elaborate, I would I would like to know that they're paused before I actually submit the application. Um, uh, that's just a, a random user, you know, U, UI thought that popped into my head. So I thought I'd, I'd share it with you. No, that, that's fair. And uh, yes, it's definitely... Um it's displayed on each dog whether or not the if the application pauses it says it there and they can't click any create button uh but i have this check here just so no one can pass any uh url and you ah. know advertently do anything they're not supposed to do okay yeah okay so th this other controller here um so i try pretty hard in my controllers not to have very many custom actions. And when I see custom actions in a controller, that's a, a bit of a code smell to me. And again, a code smell doesn't automatically mean that it's bad. It just means it's something to take a closer look at. Um, because I think controllers that use just the seven restful actions are easier to understand than controllers that have custom actions. Um, so let's take a look at these couple um, couple methods here. Set statuses to adoption mode. Ben, can you explain just at a high level what that means in the application? Uh, I'd have to I'd look at that one sec. So set status on all applications for a dog. All right, so if somebody, so if multiple people have applied to a dog, they can go in and then check their applications and they can see the status of where it's at. So there's multiple statuses of, you know, it's pending review, under review, adoption pending, et cetera. So other people can see where the progress is at. Now, if a dog does get adopted, then you want to communicate that with all other adopters who uh, applied on that dog, but were not successful. So it just switches all their statuses uh, in their application to adoption made. Oh, I see. Okay. So Ben, it might take me a couple passes to actually understand this one. Um, okay. So basically the, the high level idea is that when a dog is adopted, then that means other people's application status has to get set to withdrawn. Do I have that right? Um, no, it gets set to so if their if their application stages are set to withdrawn because um, somebody can go in and they can modify their application and say actually I want to withdraw and they can withdraw it. So if it's withdrawn, then the, it, that gets skipped in this this loop. Otherwise, um, for all other adopters who are unsuccessful, it changes their status to adoption made. So the next time they log in, they see ah oh, okay this dog has been adopted and it wasn't me so. I see. Okay. Okay. So let's maybe forget about the withdrawn part for a second to make it simpler to think about. If there are 10 people who applied to adopt and then somebody does adopt the dog, um, for the other nine people, their applications, each one of them, all nine of them would have their status set to adoption made? Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's something I might consider doing a little bit differently. Um, there's a saying with database design, um, if something is true, saying it twice doesn't make it any more true. Um, and the, the idea is that we wanna store each piece of truth exactly once. Because otherwise, if you store one piece of truth multiple times, then at least in theory, one of those two could get changed, but the other one doesn't get changed 
and now you have an inconsistency. I don't know off the top of my head how we might change the database structure so that you only have to change that adoption made piece of truth so it appears in one place. But obviously imagine that somehow or another adoption made gets set to uh, eight of those nine applications, but for some reason not the ninth one, now you have an inconsistency. So I don't have the answer to that, but that's something I would look at. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's you, a good thing to think about. I was just going to suggest that you could have the status on the dog itself yeah. and have the applications reference the dog, the dog status. Um, well, each the, 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 the issue there is each application is going to be at a different state mm. of review. So some will, will not be started, some will be under review. Uh, and, and yeah, so there will be different statuses. That's the challenge. It's not um, not not just a single point. Yeah, if we have time at the end, maybe we can circle back and talk more about this. My concern is we might discover that it's so complicated that we won't get to the end of it even in the rest of the time. So let's come back to that one if we have time. Okay, application controller. Just out of curiosity, has anybody worked on an app where the application controller was just monstrous? Has anybody experienced that? <laughs> yeah. I see an emphatic hand raise from Scott, and he's probably not the only one. So application controller has a tendency to become a dumping ground, and it becomes a very miscellaneous mixed bag. When I talked about essential points and incidental details, application controller often becomes a place that's just full of a bunch of miscellaneous incidental details. And it has a tendency to become a file that has very low cohesion. So Kent Beck said that a, a class has high cohesion to the extent that the things in it are tightly coupled. So to state the inverse of that, a class has low cohesion if the things in it are not tightly coupled. So I don't think anything is wrong with your application controller right now, Ben but I did want to give you that warning because you might add another method next week and a couple more methods next month. Before you know it, application controller is 300 lines long and it's just a, a whole bunch of random stuff. There are multiple ways to get away from that. One thing that I've done is um, to, to have concerns where... I don't know, maybe there are a few methods that have something to do with authentication. And so I have an authentication concern to put that stuff in. Um, this stuff specifically, let me, let me see if I can just get a quick understanding. Adopter with profile. Oh, this is some kind of authorization check. Okay. So if the user... Oh, okay. If the user has an adopter account and an adopter profile, then they're good. And otherwise we say it's unauthorized. Yep. Nailed it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, only those people can apply for a dog. If you haven't filled out your profile, then uh, you can't apply for a dog yet. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I think for the stage this application is at, this is probably fine. <laughs> But if this file starts to grow to the point where you, you think you might want to start moving some of this out, I might look at moving some of this authorization stuff into Pundit. Pundit or something, some analogous tool. I happen to like Pundit. And it looks like most of this stuff is, is authorization related, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, yeah. Um, that last one could probably go in the, maybe in the... In the... Uh, what that's doing is to make sure that when staff's um, performing CRUD on a, a dog, that it is in the same organization. So they actually have the authorization to, to edit that dog. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that might also be a good fit for Pundit. Again, I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything particularly wrong with with the, you know, you don't want to over-engineer a solution when the application is 
is so small that it's not justified. Um, so that's more a note for the future. I think this is just fine for the stage it's at now. Okay, context controller. I see that um, it doesn't look like anything's actually being persisted to the database, which surprised me. So there must be something I don't understand about this controller or something like that. Maybe the purpose of this controller mainly is to send these emails. 100%, that's it. There's um, didn't want to save any emails um, to the database. So the point of this is just for the contact form. Anyone has a question, this just creates an instance and then uh, sends it to the mailer. But no need to save. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I got this one from a blog. I got a little help with this one. Oh, okay. Yeah, if this were me doing it, I'd probably keep all the code just about the same, but make a slight shift in the way I view it. Um, what's the real thing being created? The real thing is maybe a um, contact. Um, hmm. What is it? I'm sending a contact form submission email. Um, so it might be, I might call this controller like contact form emails or something like that. Maybe. Again, when the application is small, you can afford for things to be kind of fuzzy. It doesn't need to be that precise because there's not that much there. But as things grow, that precision becomes more important. So that's maybe something I'd think about in the future. Yeah, I agree. Even even it confuses me now what that's called. So it, it should be changed, I think. Okay. Yeah, because I guess you're surely not creating a contact. That's not it. So I'm not sure what the right name is, but probably not contact. Okay. And then similar story here. There's just a number of um, custom methods here. Um, I don't know that I need to really say much because it's kind of the same comments again. But let's let's just see real quick. Select a dog. What is select a dog? Okay, for the index, we're mm. saying dog equals selected dog. So here I have a couple of filters on this um, this page in the UI. So I wanted different ways to provide a collection. And that's actually, I wasn't sure the best way to do it, but um, there's three different ways to provide a collection here. Oh, okay. Maybe let's look at that two, two ways view real quick. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you'll be able to get into it. Uh, it's behind, you know, you'd have to log in, um, but it's for, oh, um, it's for staff. So when staff are viewing their dogs, they can, um, view a single dog. Uh, they can look at all their adopted dogs or they can look at all of their unadopted dogs. Oh, okay. Oh, I just meant the, oh, sorry. Yeah. The view yeah. file, um, yeah. app yeah. views, organization dogs. Yeah, it's this is one of those places where I have logic in the view file that uh, your talk last week was probably. Oh um, yeah, talking about. Uh huh. Yeah, this seems like potentially a good case for either view component or a decorator or something like that. Um. Okay. Well, I don't think I'm going to be able to grasp this in real time here, but it sounds like based on last week's talk, you have some ideas as to what you could do with that. And then my very last tab here. We have registrations controller. And then we have send email, which happens when, oh, I see it's an after action. Yeah, this is another case where I would probably put that right in. I don't see a create action. So maybe it's like implicit. Because I know with Rails, you don't actually have to have the method defined. As long as you have the route defined, you can go there. Um, yeah. So is, this, is that maybe the case, Ben? Yeah, this is the, the, using device. Um, and I. Oh, need, yeah. I didn't even catch that. I see. Interesting. Yeah. So in this case, maybe I would do def create and then call super and then have send email right there 
because otherwise I didn't realize there's anything happening to do with create. And then I see send email and there's nothing near here that tells me what this is for. And it's easy enough, I guess, to go up here and notice this, but it would be easier still if I could just see def create super send email. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. And that's pretty good timing because we're we're about um, at the end of the hour here. Well, Ben, thanks once again. I can't thank you enough for providing this for us. I hope this was interesting for, for everybody to see. Hope you guys got something out of this. Um, and Ben, if you ever want to do this again, like maybe you want to uh, take a few of these suggestions and implement them. Um, I, I would love to take another look if you're interested in that. And the other thing, Ben, I, I noticed there aren't any tests in the test folder that I saw at least. If ever you want to do this again and you want to like pair live and we backfill and add some tests and that kind of thing, I would definitely be up for doing that too. No, that, that's amazing. Uh, amazing, Jason. There are there are tests that's on, that uh, Eduardo and I and uh, one other guy have been working on hard the last uh, couple of weeks to, to, to do. We have mostly integration tests. Um, it's pretty decent coverage now, but it could be better. Um, okay. Yeah. But yeah, that, that would be great as well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we can obviously talk about that offline. Um, thanks again, Ben. And thank you everybody for coming and I will see you next time. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, thanks everyone. Ben. Thank you guys. That was awesome. Yeah. It was awesome.